So the inverse of that will look like this. I'm horrible with 3D. It will look like this. This is the inverse we'll call G sub X, which is equal to the inverse of F. Looks like a bowling pin, I don't know. You close this end and that end. So what our book is saying, if F, let me just write this, let F be a function that is continuous, which that's the case. Uh, somebody's stomach there hungry there on the interval from here to there you know during that segment which is continuous if F has an inverse which in this case it does which we'll call it F of minus 1 of X or I'll call it G sub X Then the following are true. We'll say the following statements are true. First one it's just by looking at it if F is continuous at its domain then G which is the inverse function is also continuous <coughs> bless you at its domain. Now remember from inverse functions, I didn't say the same domain. Why? Because the domain of F becomes what? The range of Y or G here. And the range of F becomes what? The domain. So the X value for the function becomes the Y value for the, infer the inverse. The Y values for this become the X values for that one. So that's the first statement. The second statement, also if the function is differentiable, which means has a derivative, if f is differentiable, on an, an interval, on a section, any section, that contains a point um, containing the point C here and the derivative at C does not equal to zero. You'll see in a second why that can't be zero. Then the inverse or the inverse f of minus one is also differentiable at that point. At f of c, the y value, not c actually, really f of c. And if you want to find up, I'll even put the third condition. If you want to find the derivative of the inverse function, that's where we're going with. We'll do an example that has all these in it. 
the derivative of the inverse function is 1 over the derivative of f at g sub x. Hmm. Let me go back to this function. Is this function continuous? Yes. Let me pick a point on that function, like 2 comma 3. I don't know, I'm just picking a point on that. Let's say this is 2 comma 3. It says if the function is continuous, the inverse is continuous. That's the first statement. We see that. If the function has a derivative at that point, at C, let's say C here, right there. And that value, the derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line, we know that's not a zero, right? The slope is not a zero, you can see it's rising. Then G sub X, the inverse, has a derivative at that value. So at three comma two, not two comma three, at three comma two, it might be somewhere here. This function also has a derivative, that's what that means. Notice 2, 3, this is 3, 2, backward, at that value. C is 2, the, der the y value is 3. It says this function g at 3, comma 2, when x is 3, the y value is going to be 2. That's what the inverse. The 2 becomes the 3, the 3 becomes the 2. The g at 3 will have a derivative 2. And to find the derivative for any point on that, we can find it by taking this one. A lot of times, I don't want to take the inverse and find its derivative, because this one says find the inverse function to find the derivative of that. g sub x is the inverse. Find the inverse first, then go ahead and find the derivative for my function and plug it in. Ugh, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do it that way. Can I get that quicker? The answer is yes using that equation. But let's take an example first, go through it, to see if that equation, equation C, is really true. Let's take a function, f of x, that's y, 5x minus 8. Let's just pick a simple function. I don't want to spend too much time on it, deriving the last one. Well, let's make it 5x squared, I don't know. Minus 8, that's fine. Uh, I can define that from 0 to 1, you know? It'll be 1 to 1, you know? Because otherwise, the inverse of that is not really a function. I can go, this is from 0 to 1. Because when you graph that, it will look something like this. If you're looking at one side, 0 to 1, I don't know where the 1 is going to be. Right there. We're looking at that little piece just right there. So the inverse of that should be a function. What's the derivative of that? 10x. Now, if I want to find the inverse function, what's the inverse function? I'm going to call that g sub x. Well, to find the inverse function, how do we do it? We let y equals 5x squared minus 8, if you remember, three steps change f of x to y, interchange x and y, solve it for y, and what is y equal to? 
if you want, you can make that 1 fifth x minus 8 over 5 to what power? Is that the 1 half? And this is your g sub x. That's the inverse function. Is when? Oh, plus. Yeah, when you bring this to the side, that's a plus. Thank you. To the one half. My question is, or my, I'm trying to prove that the derivative of the inverse, or find the derivative of the inverse, and I want to prove I can find it by using this equation. We'll see if that's true. Actually, I want to see if that's that statement is really true. So what's the derivative of the inverse? This is the inverse function. Can I take the derivative of that? This will be 1 half times what? 1 fifth x plus 8 over 5 to the power of what? Negative 1 half times the derivative of what's on the inside. What's the derivative of 1 fifth x plus 8 over 5? 1 fifth. So when you clean it, that would be 1 over 10 times the square root of 1 fifth x plus 8 over 5. If you don't like the way that looks, you can make it 1 over 10, the square root of x plus 8 over 5, like this. That's the derivative of the inverse. So the way I found it is actually I found the inverse, went through that, found the inverse, then took the derivative. Oh, well, that's a lot of work. What I'm going to show you next, not really much easier. This one says, you can take, actually, find the derivative by using this method, which is what? Let's see if it gives me the same answer. Let's see, what is 1 over f prime of g sub x? What is g sub x equal to? I just did that one. g sub x is this one right? x plus 8 over 5, take the square root of that. See that? Take the derivative at that point. Well, the derivative of f is what? 10 times x. See the derivative? f prime of x equals 10 times x. So when you ask what is f prime of this, go to that function every time you see x, take it out and replace it with this. What are you going to have? 1 over 10 times. Replace x with the square root of x plus 8 over 5. Is this the same answer as the other one? Yes. You're saying, well, it's still a lot of work. You still got to find the derivative. You got to find the inverse. You're right. But if they ask me at a point, I don't have to find the inverse. Watch what I'm going to do next now. I just want to prove that this statement is true. Now, we just prove that this is true, that's true, this is true. Let's use that one to find the derivative at a point. Then from there, I'm going somewhere with it. Let's take this function. One fourth x cubed plus x minus one. 
Two questions. What is the value of the inverse of f when x equals 3? That's the first one. Number two, question number two. What is the value of the derivative of the inverse? The derivative of the inverse at x equals 3. What is the inverse when x equals 3? If you try to find the inverse of this function, good luck. And I mean it. I don't think I could do it. And I'm decent with math. Because you're going to make it y equals 1 fourth x cubed plus x minus 1. Swab x and y. You'll have x equals 1 fourth y cubed plus y minus 1. How would you solve it for y? You can't. You got y cubed and y. You can factor a y out, big deal. So we've got to be creative here. It says, tell me what is, basically what I'm asking here, question A, let me go back to A with different color. I'm asking what is the inverse at 3. That's what I'm asking for. Can you tell me what that answer is when x is 3? Well, remember with inverse function, the domain here of the function becomes what? The range for the inverse. The domain for this is the range for that. So when we ask you what is the inverse at 3, all I'm asking, what value of x? that if you plug it in, the answer is 3. Because the domain is 3 for the inverse. I mean, that's the domain. Then you should equal the range of the function. The domain of the inverse, the range of the function. They have to be the same. The domain is the range. The range is the domain. Flip-flop them. Since I'm looking when x is 3, that's my domain. So I want to make sure f of x has a range of equal to 3. What value will make that a 3? If you look at it, move the minus 1 to this side. And if I look at it, it looks like 2 is the only one. Notice when x is 2, just look at it. What's 2 cubed? Isn't 2 cubed 8? 8 divided by 4 is what? 2 plus 2? Four. So x will have to be 2. So the question now, what is the inverse function at 3? That's equal to 2. Now, we answer that. Notice the domain of this becomes the range of that. Part B now, that's the fun one. What is the derivative at 3? Well, if you remember that equation, where is it? Where did I put it? The derivative at any value is equal to, let's plug in here, base on this equation is equal to 1 over the derivative at g sub x, isn't that the inverse? g sub x is the inverse of f. So it's the derivative at the inverse of 3. Well, I know what the inverse of 3 is. I just found that answer. See, that answer is 2. So that's 1 over the derivative at 2. 
And what's the derivative of this function? Derivative f, notice. The derivative of f is what? 3 over 4. This will be 3 over 4 x squared plus 1. You want to find the value at x equals to 2. When x is 2, what do you have? 2 squared is 4 times 3 over 4, that's 3, plus 1, that's 1 fourth. So what is the derivative of the inverse function at 3? It's 1 fourth. Did I have to find the inverse function? No. I didn't have to find the inverse function or take its derivative. I use the shortcut here. If you want to find the derivative of the inverse, it's 1 over the derivative of the function at that value. Where this comes in handy I'll do another one here Now I'll, I'll start doing where this comes in handy Let me just try one more example Again, take this function f of x equals x squared again if you take the inverse of that, it's not a function, so I have to put some restriction, x is greater than zero. That's a one-to-one -one function now. And if you graph that, it's a parabola, you know what it looks like. It will look something like this. You know, it keeps going. Then if you do the inverse of that, it's gonna be also something like this. I'll do a blue color for the inverse. like a fish now. This is the inverse function and this is the function. So notice it does fit the criteria. This function is continuous at its domain, so is the inverse. If you want to find the derivative, let's say the question, what is the derivative of the inverse at 4? We'll ask that question. What's the derivative of the inverse function at x equals to 4. Well, according to the shortcut, it says 1 over the derivative of f at the inverse of function at 4. And to find this value first, I can take the inverse, I mean the derivative is 2x, it's not a big deal. But to find the answer to this, what is f negative 1 at 4? That's the first thing you have to find. What is that equal to? You take your function f of x, which is equal to x squared, and you set it equal to 4. Can you find an x value that will make that function equal to 4? 2, because it says x is bigger than 0. Can't be negative 2. So you want to find the derivative now at 4? It's 1 over the derivative of f. What's the derivative of f? 2x? at x equals to 2. Notice I don't use the quotient rule. I'm not taking the derivative of the fraction. It's 1 divided by the derivative of f. The derivative of f is 2x, and you want it at that value, not the 4, at 2. So the answer for that is 1 fourth. And if I ask you what's the derivative of the inverse at 9,
or nope, it's going to be 1 over f prime. Uh, you need to find the inverse of 9 first. You need to find that value. How do you find the inverse of 9? At 9, you take your function, which is x squared, set it equal to 9, you find the value of x that will make that 9. So x will have to be what? 3. So the answer for this will be 1 over 2x at x equals 3. When x3, 1 over 2 times 3, 1, 6. So again, no reason to find the inverse function. No reason to take the derivative. Plug them in. Now, we didn't bring this just for this example. This is fine, cute, and all the stuff. The reason we're interested in that, uh, if you look at your calculator there, let me take a function. Let's look at the calculator. I don't know if you can see mine on the screen or not. Can you see it? What is over the tan function, the cosine and the sine? These are the inverse functions. So let's take the inverse tan. f of x equals the inverse 10. Now, with, with trig function, we, never, we write on the calculator 10 to the minus 1. But a lot of people get confused. Is that a power or what? So a lot of times to avoid that, we go arc 10. That means the inverse of 10. Arc 10. The inverse of 10. Arc sine. Arc cosine. Arc secant. So arc means the inverse. So if f of x equals, here we go. Let me make f of x actually equals tangent x for now. Uh, I'm going to take the derivative tangent, which is the arc 10 inverse of that. Let's call this just a tangent instead of fx. Let's go, let me clean a little bit there. Let's call it tangent x inverse. The reason I put that notation, if f of x, I want to use that rule, equals tangent x, can I use that rule to find the derivative of the inverse of that? What's the derivative of the inverse? Which is really the derivative of the arc 10. That's what I'm trying to find, trying to derive what that is. Because I know the inverse of f of x is the arc 10. How can I find the answer to that? Well, according to this rule, where's that rule? It's 1 over f prime of r10. What's the derivative of tangent? Because I need to find the derivative of tangent, which is what? Do we have a derivative of tangent? Which is what? Secant squared x, right? So this is going to be 1 over secant squared of arc tangent x. Mm. I don't like that. I need to play with it.
Look on the board. Secant squared is equal to what? Isn't that tangent squared plus 1? Can you see that? Secant squared theta equals tangent squared theta plus 1. So if I use that trig identity, this will be tangent of arc tangent. Don't forget to square it, because it says square it, plus the 1. What's the purpose of this step? What's the tangent of the arc tangent? Just x, whatever the argument is. They cancel each other out. Tangent of arc tangent, the inverse of the function is always going to be x. This will be x squared plus 1. So the derivative, that's the only one I'm going to derive tonight. The rest I'll just write them. The derivative tangent of x is 1 over x squared plus 1. We can derive the other ones, but too much time. You saw one? The rest just playing with the trig identities. But when you take the sine of the arc sine, they cancel each other out. When you take the cosine of arc cosine, they cancel each other out. When you take the secant of arc secant, they cancel each other out. The reason they cancel each other out, there is, in math, we said if you take, if you want to prove one is the inverse of the other, if you take the inverse of the function, the result is always x. Or the function of the inverse, that's the Fag and Goff function. Remember that composite function? That's how we prove that these guys are the inverse of each other. If the result of this gives you x, or the result of this gives you x, that tells you these two functions are the inverse of each other. Here, I'm telling you, they are the inverse. This is the inverse of this. So the result has to be just the argument, which is x. And when you square it, that becomes x squared. I know you're excited about the derivation. Here's the list of them. So we know one of them. But before I put the tangent, let me start with the sine, cosine, and the sine I can do actually differently, easier, probably prove it. Maybe I'll do that. I say I'm not gonna prove it. Maybe I'll do one one more. But I'll prove that differently. The derivative arc sine, inverse sine. I'm going to put u here, not just x. It will be 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times the derivative of u. And when you clean that, you can write that a little bit nicer. We'll look u sub prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. The derivative of our cosine just like the arc sine all the ones with CO's has a negative value the derivative of our tan or is dark tan, yep. We just did the tan, we said what? One over x squared plus one? Well, if it's a u, it will be what? u prime over one plus u squared or u squared plus one, it's up to you how you wanna write it. Because when you're adding, it doesn't really make a difference which one you write first. Our cotangent cotangent begins with the C, so it's going to be a negative. We get the secant, the cosecant. This is U sub prime over the absolute value of U times the square root of U squared minus 1. 
So you want to take a wild guess what the cosecant, oh, secant, not cosecant, this one. The cosecant will be what? A minus. The secant will be what? Positive. So all the ones begin with C, they're going to be pos negative values, all the other ones positive. These two are the same, except the minus sign. These two are the same, except the minus sign. These two are the same, except the minus sign. So it looks like six of them, but there are really three of them, and the other three are negative values. All the ones with the C are negative values. I can derive actually the sign quickly, different way, different than the tangent, just to give you a different way, then you know, this will be the last time I will derive them. I didn't even want to derive this way, but I'll show it to you. If I give you, let y equals arc sine of x, and the sine to be a one-to-one -one function, if you remember, sine of x will look like this, right? So this is good from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Because I want it to be a one-to-one -one function. I'm only looking at that piece. Can you see that little piece? That's a one-to-one -one function. And I want to derive what the derivative of that dy dx. We know, if I memorize the equations, we know from this one the answer is what? Since this is x, that would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But I'm going to derive that. And I don't know much about arc sine, so I say, you know what? I know from trig. I took tech math, and if I take the sine of both sides, When you take the sine of the arc sine, they cancel each other out. So sine of y equals x. And really, if w what that means is you have an angle. If you look at the trig here, you have an angle. I'm going to derive that to y. It's that value. This angle is called y, and the sine is x. That's x over what? 1, right? That means the opposite is x, and this is 1. Remember Sakatoa? The sine is opposite over the hypotenuse. Can you find this side? Pythagorean's theorem. It's going to be the square root, if you do Pythagorean's theorem, of 1 minus x squared. This side squared minus that side squared. You can see where it's coming from, the 1 minus x squared on the bottom. So now let's take the derivative sine u. What's the derivative? Cosine u times, I mean cosine y times what? dy dx. Equals 1. What's dy dx? It's 1 over cosine of y. And when you look at this one, what is cosine of y? Isn't that the adjacent over the hypotenuse? The adjacent is what? 1 minus x squared, the square root of that, divided by 1. And that's the answer. That's the equation. The derivative of arc sine of x is the derivative of x, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But that's really the math behind it. I should have did this instead of the tangent. But you get to see two of them tonight. Yeah. You don't have to know to derive any of them. Just got to memorize. Where are they? Where'd you go? 
Memorize these rules. Once you memorize them, you're in good shape. So I'm going to practice with them. I'll leave this sheet handy somewhere. So let's take some examples. What's the derivative of arc sine 2x? Now remember, this is your u here. So the derivative arc sine is what? u bar over the square root of 1 minus u squared. Plug it in. What is u sub prime? 2 over the square root of what? 1 minus what is u squared? 4x squared. And you're done. That's it. One step. What's the derivative of r10 3x? Again, this is your u here. And for the 10, what's the equation? u sub prime over 1 plus u squared. What is u sub prime here? 3 over 1 plus what? 9x squared. Done. One step. How about the next one? What is the derivative of arc? What do you want? Cosine? The square root of x. This is u. The answer to that negative u prime over 1 minus u squared. The bottom is straightforward. 1 minus, when you take the square root of x and you square it, that's just x. But what's the derivative of the square root of x? That's x to what power? 1 half, so it'll be 1 half, good. x to what power? Negative 1 half. So when I clean that, that 2 is going to go on the bottom. This will be the square root of x in the bottom. Uh, with the minus sign, right? I left the minus, because there's a minus in the front. And the only thing I can do if I want to multiply the square roots together, this will be what? x times, distribute that, x times 1 is x minus x times x, x squared. That's what it's, as far as you can go with it. You can't multiply the 2 unless you bring it inside and make it a 4. But not much you can do with it. I'll do one more. And we'll do arc secan. e to the 2x. So the secant is u sub prime over the square root uh, uh, with value of u times the square root of u squared minus 1. e to the 2x. Notice I didn't put absolute value. Why? It's always a positive value. It's 
positive, you don't need to have the absolute value. Square e to the 2x. What's e to the 2x times e to the 2x? e to the 4x. When you multiply, you add the exponent. 2x plus 2x is 4x minus the 1. And what is the derivative of e to the 2x? Very good, 2e to the 2x. It's e to the 2x times the derivative of this, which is 2. Does anything cancels out? Look at e to the 2x here. Same thing. So I end up with 2 over the square root of e to the 4x minus the 1. And that's the end of this section, is knowing the derivative, the inverse, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant.